Hi, everybody, and welcome to Exegetically Speaking, a podcast of the friends and faculty of Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois. And this year, we're partnering together with the Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas, to bring you these podcasts. My name is David Capes, and I'm the Senior Research Fellow at the Library, former Dean in the School of Biblical Theological Studies at Wheaton College. Our purpose in these podcasts is pretty simple. We want to promote the study of biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, so we can read the Bible more faithfully, study it more fully, and not just read it, but also to live it. Joining me today is Drew Burlingame, Assistant Professor of Hebrew at Wheaton College. He's a Ph.D. candidate at the University of Chicago studying Northwest Semitic Philology. Drew, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate you being with us. Glad to be here. First of all, how did you get started doing biblical languages? I've been interested in languages for a long time, since, uh, since as long as I can remember, uh, studying other languages was a, a topic of interest and fascination. And uh, During college, I started studying uh, classical languages, focusing specifically on Greek and Hebrew, uh, and then with Hebrew, uh, realizing that that served really as a gateway into a lot of other Semitic languages just kind of caught the bug, and uh, I, I couldn't get enough of it, so yeah. I kept going in that direction. And and w- when you say Semitic languages, w- what does that category cover? Yeah, so the Semitic language family is an immense language family. We have lots of languages, even those still spoken today, that fit within this language family. Uh, It's traditionally divided into Eastern and Western branches, and Eastern Semitic languages would include languages like Akkadian, uh, which many of your listeners may have heard of. Mm -hmm. West Semitic is where we find languages that that belong, for example, to the Northwest Semitic branch, such as Ugaritic, Aramaic, and then Canaanite languages like Hebrew and Phoenician uh, and other related dialects from from the region. And these languages are all related, right? They are, that's right. I mean, they, they share vocabulary, they share ideas, they share concepts, I guess, through trade and other other things that happened uh, at, at the time as these people mixed. Yeah, there's a lot of overlap in terms of, of grammar, you know, from syntax and morphology, uh, as well as shared vocabulary. You're right. Let's talk about Psalm 2. That's one of the things we want to talk about today. And uh, you've got an interesting reading that is informed by some Ugaritic text. Tell us what we're getting into with Psalm 2. Is it verse 5, I think it is, right? Yeah, so this is a this is an interesting new idea that's been put forward by a, a scholar at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, named Joseph Lamb, and uh, I find it to be a compelling suggestion, and I think it's one worth our, our time to consider. Psalm 2 is a, a well-known royal psalm in which God's support for his anointed king against those who oppose him is described. Uh, the psalm starts off by stating that earthly rulers and princes are taking counsel together and taking a stand together in opposition to God and his anointed king. Uh, Now, Lamb has recently observed that the language that's used here is actually evocative of a courtroom setting. So the expressions that we find in the opening verse Hmm. of the psalm are are the kinds of expressions that you ordinarily find used to describe legal contests. So after the plans of the rulers are described, God is said to respond in four ways. He laughs at them. He scoffs at them. He speaks to them in his anger. And then, as traditionally understood, he terrifies them in his wrath. What Lamb has observed is that the last of these is a little bit unexpected in light of the first three. All the, the first three verbs are, are verbs of speaking, and they make sense as imaginable responses of a judge who's arbitrating in this metaphorical legal contest between the princes of the earth and the anointed Davidic king. Terrifying mm-hmm. the ending party is not really what we necessarily expect. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's exactly true, I guess. So, so what does he suggest? What does Lamb suggest? Well, the verb in question here that's traditionally been understood uh, as to terrify may be understood a little differently now as a result of recent developments in the study of the Ugaritic language, which is a language closely related to Hebrew. There's an interesting legal text that's written in Ugaritic, which was uh, discovered in 1994, but only published in 2012. uh, Wow, that's pretty recent then. Yeah, yeah. The king of Ugarit gives a man named Abdi Milku the right to leave his property to whichever of his sons he wants to. The text goes on to describe that conversely, uh, Abdi Milku may dismiss or disinherit whichever of his sons he wishes. And what Lamb has observed is that the verb that appears here referring to disinheritance is cognate to the verb in Hebrew that we find in Psalm 2, verse 3. Hmm. On this basis, he raises an interesting possibility. While it's true that the verb in in the Hebrew uh, typically refers to hastening or terrifying elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible, He suggests that in Psalm 2, where legal contest, and as we'll see in a moment, inheritance are specifically at issue, the verb may be used in a more technical sense to refer to disinheritance. And if that's the case, then God's response in verses 4 to 5 make perfect sense. He's he's laughing, scoffing, speaking, 
and then dismissing or disinheriting these earthly rulers. So he dismisses the case, in other words. Yeah, yeah, or disinherits the princes of the earth. Uh, and it's right, right. Five. I think I said verse 3 a moment ago. It's verse 5. So you're pretty persuaded by that. I think it's definitely worth consideration. I mean, we, we do have other psalms where God is said to terrify earthly rulers in a, in a similar way. Right. Uh, but in this context uh, where we have inheritance in the immediately following verses, it's worth, worth consideration. So, for example, uh, immediately following this action on the, on the part of, uh, of God, we find in verse 7 uh, that he speaks, Oh, yeah. Speaking, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And then in verse 8, ask of me and I'll make nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. So the image, in other words, would be one in which the earthly kings are being stripped of their territories and titles, and those are being handed over to the anointed king of Psalm 2 as his inheritance. Uh, I, uh, I think it's a con- compelling and exciting example. Yeah, and you know, early Christians took Psalm 2 as, as a kind of a messianic text yeah. and often referred that language of, you are my son, today I've begotten you, uh, over to Jesus as well, yeah, who, who, who was portrayed you know, as the king of kings ultimately and the Lord of all lords, right? Yeah, we, I think it's uh, quoted explicitly in Acts 13. Yeah. Hey, well, that's, a, that's an interesting reading of that text, and I, I find it fairly— uh, of course, I haven't read the article that you're talking about, but I sort of resonate with your thinking on this and how it sounds, and particularly when you come later to verse, I guess, at 8, "'Ask of me, and I make the nations your inheritance.'" So the idea of dismissing one's inheritance and saying, no, it will not be yours, it will be his, makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's an exciting example to see how study of other related languages like Ugaritic can shed light even on very familiar passages, help us to understand them in their historical and cultural contexts better. Drew, thanks for being a part of our show today. Thank you. Thanks as well to Silvio Vasquez, Rebecca Larson, and Krista Sanchez for helping us edit and produce this podcast. Thanks to Phil Keggy for our music. If you want to study biblical languages, then you know what you need to do. You need to go to Wheaton College. Best place, hands down. They have a great program. Whether you want to be a graduate or undergraduate student, go to the website, www.wheaton.edu. Look for modern and classical languages. Get started today. If you have questions or comments about this podcast, we'd love to hear from you. Contact us at exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. That's exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks for listening.